Hey everybody, Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com and uh, doing something interesting here for episode number 205. I have changed my seating position for the first time in like forever for Q&A. Uh, I'm seated in a different part of my office. I know it's not super drastic, uh, but I thought it was kind of fun and interesting and uh, you know, here we are. So uh, props to Andy for setting this up at the very last minute. I was like, hey, can we move to a different place? I'm just getting kind of bored. So here we are, got Jake's uh, craftsmanship picture over here in the corner that I used to have behind me a few Q and A's ago and uh, you know, just trying to mix it up a little bit. So we're gonna see how this goes. Give me feedback about, let me know, you know, let me know if you like it. If you want, I can try shooting Q and A and, and other locations from time to time. Just mix it up a little bit, you know? But those of you listening on the audio podcast, it's probably gonna sound pretty darn similar, but just imagine, just imagine that I'm sitting in a different place. Maybe it'll feel different to you somehow. Uh, but anyway, I got an interesting Q&A for you, so uh, we'll get into that in just a second. So this week we've had uh, some interesting stuff. We've had some more snow, uh, which is now spring technically, and it's snowing outside. And I know those of you who are in the Northeast and definitely other parts of the country, other parts of the world, are dealing with it way worse than we are, but we here in Virginia, we just don't know what to do with snow, especially in the spring. So our office is like cleared out practically at this point and school was canceled and it was just like my kids love it but uh you know rachel's at home with the kids right now kind of going stir crazy so it's just we've had a lot of snow days this winter but anyway go figure what are you gonna do um we got a really cool video out this week that i'm super pumped about actually as of recording this it really just went out a couple of hours ago it's on the top uh, sorry not top seven it's the seven fountain pen myths that you need to stop believing. And it's really fun. Uh, went out on a limb on this one in terms of the style of it. Props to Andy for um, coming up with the vision for this one and helping execute it. Uh, it's really quite funny if you have not seen it yet. It's meant to be completely uh, kind of uh, not taken too seriously, but still I think the content is pretty solid. Uh, I do stand behind what I say in the video, but it's a little bit of a, you know, uh, not a tongue in cheek, but it's, yeah, it's, just, it's meant to be not that serious. So it's just kind of fun. Uh, and we're hoping to mix these styles of video in a little bit. You know, some of our, um, you know, more popular videos have been kind of of this lighthearted style. And we're trying to mix it up a little bit and do more stuff like this just because it's kind of fun. You know, fountain pens are fun and it's fun to, you know, do, do interesting content like this. So I think we're going to try to mix it up a little bit. You know, we've been doing a lot of right nows. We just published, you know, 24, 25 of them this week. And, uh, you know, that's really cool. But I think we're going to slow it down just a little bit on the right nows. Maybe go to like two a week. Um, and then we're going to mix in some more uh, slices. We're still going to have Q&A every Friday. Um, we're going to take the top, uh, you know, pieces of content from Q&A, slice it out and publish those. And then we're also going to look at doing some other styles like some tips and tricks, some how to's, you know, the top like listicle style videos like the like the myths one. I've got some other ideas. Um, I've got an idea for a fountain pen hacks video that I think we're going to do uh, fairly soon here. And so I think uh, it'll be pretty interesting and we're going to try to mix it up a little bit. So just in case you see us changing and playing around with the rhythm of our video publishing on YouTube here, don't be alarmed by that. We're just trying to, you know, have something that's a really good pace that mixes up the content, gives you a nice little variety of things to have throughout your week. But we're going to look to publish probably five or six times a week. So it's going to be a lot to keep up with. But um, most of the videos we're going to try and keep at least somewhat on the shorter side. Q&A is kind of like the marathon of the week, right? Uh, but anyway, so it should be fun. Um, some new stuff that we got in, we got Pilot Decimo in black and navy. So it's kind of cool. We weren't actually expecting them for another month or so. And just this week, it was like, hey, these are coming. We're like, sweet, great, bring it in. You know, something new that has Pilot has going on. So we're excited about having that. So if you're a fan of the Decimo or the Vanishing Point, you want something a little thinner than, you know, in the Decimo, uh, you can check that out. Very popular pen style and to have it in a couple of uh, new colors is always kind of fun. Um, Field Notes came out with a new uh, seasonal edition. They do this definitely from time to time and they have one that this is kind of interesting. They, they always have really interesting kind of themes going on with theirs. This one is Coastlines. So they took uh, the United States coast and they split it out into two different notebook packets. And what's cool about this, I'm on the East Coast, so I'll feature the East Coast one. Um, what's cool is that when you, um, it's got foil covers and when you put the coast together, let's see if I do this right, where is the coast? Okay, there's Florida. And then here's the Carolinas. Is that right? No. Wait, is it? Is that right? No. Where am I? Okay, hang on. I'm get. I'm gonna get it. I promise. Uh huh. Uh huh. Maybe. There we go. So when you put the notebooks together, 
it makes the East Coast. There's Florida, see? That's kind of fun, right? And then it does the same thing with West Coast. So depending on which coasts you are more fond of, you can have uh, the coast of your choice in these little notebooks, and that's kind of cool. And then it has um, these little like grid kind of crosshatch, uh, you know, crosses, X's, uh, sideways X's, whatever you want to call it, um, that kind of go from like a blue to kind of a greenish pattern, and it kind of varies a little bit from page to page. So it's nice kind of a blue green, it's meant to be kind of the water on the coast. Uh, it's really, really kind of fun. So that's always cool. Field, Field Notes always has really, really interesting themes with their stuff, um, you know, Fountain pen quality paper is not like absolute tops, um, but that's not necessarily their crowd, uh, but still it has a nice loyal following within the fountain pen community, so um, we carry them. So you can go check that out. Other new pens that we have, the Conklin Red Knights. This one is pretty cool. It's a Duragraph. So it's a Duragraph model. If you remember, the we had the Merlot for like a half a second, and then we had the uh, purple one. And now this is the next one, the red one. Technically the Merlot that we had uh, was actually uh, too close in color between the, uh, it was actually too close to the purple. So they, they decided not to offer that one regularly. So they had the purple one, and now they have the red one. I'm a big fan of the Zerograph. I think it's one of the best value pens that you can get in this turn relic resin acrylic uh, that you can get. And I think it looks really good. It's, it's, uh, I'm actually probably gonna get one of these for my father-in-law just because he's not an avid fan phone user, but um, it's like his company colors so I may just have to snag one of those for him uh, anyway we also got in a couple uh, Faber Castell looms in the new colors um, and we are in the process of getting those up on the site and then uh, we don't have all the nib sizes though I think we just got in mediums and we have ordered broads that we've gotten as feedback through right now everybody was throwing support behind Rachel and her affinity for broad nibs especially in the loom and so we're gonna order some more of those um, they don't have bright, vibrant colors. They're much more subdued, but we are going to have those, uh, all that they have available on our site uh, soon. Probably within the next week, we'll have most of the nib sizes. And then um, Nemosign has a couple of new pens in the Singularity in a clear version that has, uh, one is a rose gold trim. Ugh, I'll see if I can focus that. One is a rose gold trim and the other one is a black trim. I'm trying not to zoom in and out since I'm a little closer to the camera here. And I don't know how this is working. Hopefully it works for you, but rose gold trim and black trim. So you can check those out on our site, available in I think the full range of nib sizes. The rose gold one just has a regular silver nib on it, but the, uh, actually this is a black one. How about that? Doesn't have a black nib. Oh well, that's what you get. But um, pretty cool looking, I gotta admit. I think I like them. So I think they'll be uh, kind of interesting. And then um, we did get restocked finally on the Paniter Avatar. Uh, I have one right here and it changed a little bit. Part of the reason that um, we lost stock of them is because we gave them feedback about the grip because it's magnetic. Um, it was actually causing uh, a little bit of scratching on the grip on some pens. So we gave them that feedback. They redesigned the grip so they would not cause problems. So the grip of the Avatar now is much more tapered. I actually like it. It's very comfortable. It's a little thin. It's on the thin side. So I'm not as much of a fan of it because I have very large hands. And definitely in the video, it looks like my hands are huge. Look at that. Whoa. Because I have them so much closer to the camera. Anyway, uh, so the grip itself is a much stronger taper. So we're re-photographing and kind of getting those up there on the site to represent it fairly. We updated the description uh, and uh, the technical specs and stuff like that. But if you've been waiting for the avatar, it now has a new grip and it won't scratch as much. So that's pretty cool. Mad props for Paniter for uh, redesigning that. All right, let's get into some questions for this week, shall we? I will fully admit, I actually answered some of the wrong questions this week. I have to prep Q&A ahead of time. My team puts them together in a spreadsheet for me because we gather them from all over the internet, but they had prepped for 205. I got my numbers off. I thought it was 206, so they stop dumping it into the document for me to choose the questions at noon on Tuesday. I prepared it Tuesday afternoon. I guess they had kept loading in questions that came in afternoon on Tuesday. I chose only from that group for today's video. These are technically were questions that were supposed to be meant for next week. So next week, I'll probably end up answering questions that came in from this week. Anyway, I had a lot of really good ones that I ended up passing on, but I still have a really solid one for you here today. So that's a completely behind the scenes logistical thing that I just felt like I should admit. <laughs> And I don't even know why. Anyway, just to let you know, I'm, I'm human, I guess. Uh, it happens. But anyway, pen and writing questions this week um, that I have uh, starts with Laura Boggs 581 on Instagram. 
Recently, I heard that a pen with a gold nib adjusts to fit your writing style. Is this something that happens with gold nibs or fountain pens in general? Funny you should ask that, Laura. I just talked about that in this week's fountain pen myths video. Uh, I talked about this in Q&A before. Honestly, I took this question just because I wanted to plug the fountain pen in this video. And full disclosure, in the fountain pen myths video, this question was one that I doubted myself about how I answered it, probably the most of any of them, just because I know how somewhat controversial this, this question can be. Um, so basically, some people believe that fountain pen nibs are like very romantic and deeply personal and like there's this idea out there that a fountain pen like conforms to you and your individual writing style and it's like, I think that that idea gets taken a little bit too far. It's a metal fountain pen nib. It's not adjusting to you that quickly. Like you can manipulate the nib to do whatever it is kind of you want it to do. You can change the flow, you can grind it, you can make it do all kinds of different things, but it's not going to do it that quickly <laughs> just with regular use and writing on something like paper. When you are grinding a nib and changing it and making it fit your personal preference, you're taking that to like a diamond wheel. Like it takes a ton of force and abrasion and friction to cause that to really change from the form that it is when you're just actually writing with it. Over years and years and years, you can write with it and it will kind of soften and f like flatten in the parts that you're writing with it more. But you're talking like over a long period of time of prolonged use. It's not like, you know, you're writing with a pen and you hand it to somebody, they sign their name with it. As long as they're not seriously abusing it, if they sign their name with it, it's not like their pen's ruined and now like your pen's feelings are hurt and you need to like get to know it again. It really is not like that at all. Um, you know, as long as you're not providing like such in crazy pressure or doing something really kooky with the nib, it's pretty much gonna be okay. Um, it will though, I think this, and this is where the idea needs to be nuanced a little bit. It will perform differently depending on the writing pressure, the writing speed, how you hold it, all these different things. And so in that way, the pen does change some of its own writing characteristics based on how you're writing with it. So yes, that's kind of where the idea comes from is that a pen does write a little bit differently depending on who's writing with it, but it's not that it's changing itself to fit you, it's more that you're using it differently than someone else is. Does that make sense? So anyway, I just feel like that needed to be nuanced a little bit and that's kind of where I stand. And you specifically asked about gold nibs. So I wanted to talk about that a little bit. Um, it's, it doesn't really necessarily matter. It's the tip of the nib that is really doing the writing. And that is not made of gold in most pens. Most pens that have gold nibs, gold is a pretty soft metal. And so most pens that have uh, a gold nib are gonna have a tipping material that's a very hard, precious metal made up of some kind of platinum, rhodium, some, some uh, very hard metal. And uh, it's not really going to conform. The thing that a gold nib will do a little differently than a steel nib because gold is softer than steel is if you are writing with more pressure, it could flex out the tines, it could bend, it could open up a little bit more and write wetter uh, sooner than a steel nib would maybe. Um, and that's kind of about what it'll, it'll do. So um, I don't wanna take the idea so far and say that like, you know, the pen like gets to know you and writes differently for you. You know, it's more about how you're holding it and how you're conforming to it than it is it conforming to you. Does that make sense? All right, cool. This next question is from Benjamin Nielsen on Instagram. Stub nibs are commonly sized as 1.2 and 1.5. How does this compare to fine, medium, and broad nibs of both European and Japanese origin? Okay. I don't know about 1.2. I actually commonly see it as 1.1, at least with the pens that we, that we sell at Goulet. 1.2 is not as common, but it's usually 1.0 or 1.1, but sure, 1.2 would fit in the mix as well. But yeah, you're usually seeing something more in that 1.1 range and a 1.5, sometimes a 1.9 like Lamy, but not as often. Usually a 1.5 is as high as most pen companies are going in terms of stock stub nibs. Um, but you're asking, how does that compare in terms of the thickness, right? Because the thing about stub nibs is they usually have some kind of number associated with them. So you tend to think of them as being more precise and more exact, whereas fine, medium, broad is kind of like, woo, could be anything, right? Um, yes and no. So the, as much as you may not like to hear it, the stub nibs 
do not mean if I have a 1.1 millimeter, it's gonna put a 1.1 millimeter line down on the paper. No, not really. It's definitely uh, not always the case, not often the case, because the width of the nib, that's including the rounded portion of the nib, and that's the width at like the widest point. When that nib is rounded over on a stub, the part that's actually touching the paper, it's not the full width of the nib. It's a little bit less than that, maybe uh, only 80% or 75% of the full width of the nib will actually be touching the paper. And then depending on the absorbency of the paper, and the the uh, type of ink that you have and the wetness of the pen and all these different things, it could vary even a little bit from there. So you could have, I'm not joking, the exact same width of stub nib or ball nib for that matter. And you could get different, slightly different line widths. I know it's super annoying and I know you want it to be precise, but that's kind of what you get. So um, one really helpful tool um, is uh, uh, Richard Bender on his site, richardspens.com. I can't give you a direct link to that because of the way his site's structured, but he, you can poke around and find, he has a, um, what does he call it? I'm trying to remember the exact, uh, uh, a stroke width chart. Okay, and he came up with this in 2013, so I want to give him credit for it because I know he put in a lot of work to get this done, but he basically inked up his pens and, and measured the line of the width on the page. So this is using his paper and, you know, Waterman blue ink or, or, or blue black equivalent ink. And, uh, and he, he measured the actual width of the line. So some of this will be a little, a little wacky just because we're talking about stub nibs, the actual width measurement of the nib itself, and then you're talking about line width on the page. But um, I think it's worth noting because he does actually demarcate Japanese versus European nibs on there. And there's a bit of a rounding, a bit of an estimation. Depending on the brand, it could change a little bit, but um, he does have some generalities in there. So um, talking about fine nibs, he has uh, a European fine as around a 0.5 millimeter, and then a Japanese fine as around a 0.4 millimeter, okay? A medium nib is about a 0.6 millimeter uh, in the European, and then a 0.55 millimeter in Japan. Gets a little closer. Uh, the broad nib, 0.8 millimeter in European, and then 0.75 in Japan. So as you're getting bigger, the actual amount that you're able to distinguish between the two is not as drastic, especially by percentage, right? Stub nibs typically advertise their actual width, as I just mentioned, not necessarily the line they draw, so you gotta keep that in mind. About 75, 80% of the width of the full stub nib is what you're gonna see on the page. That's a bit of a generality, but I haven't seen as much of a drastic difference in the line width of stub nibs between European and Japanese nibs. Now, I haven't done exhaustive research of that. There's not that many Japanese stubs that I've used, to be quite honest with you. There's a couple, but I have not done uh, exhaustive measurements of them, so my own ignorance on that, apologize. Um, but if you are looking for something um, that is closer to like a 1.2 or 1.5, just to give you an idea, you know, a 1.0 uh, stub, so like the Pilot Vanishing Point stub, for example, or the Plumix or something like that, um, that is gonna be, I'll give you an actual line width uh, a little closer to a broad nib, maybe a little bit wider, okay? It's gonna vary a little bit there. If you want closer to a 1.5, then you're looking something more in the double or even triple broad range. So going with a broad or maybe even a double broad for a 1.1 or 1.2, and then definitely kind of moving up into that triple broad range, which let's be honest, there's just not that many triple broads out there so you're gonna have kind of, a, kind of a hard time finding any real comparison beyond just a stub. But, uh, and then, you know, when you're getting into this, this line width of really fat, you know, lines like this, there's not a huge difference between uh, Japanese and European. So um, I think that's kind of what you're looking at if you're looking for any type of, you know, stub equivalent. Going as broad as possible as you can is pretty much gonna be the way that you're gonna to wanna to go. Um, but if you go to a Nibmeister and if you're looking for some very specific measurement to try to get, you know, think about this and you can maybe use this, maybe use Richard's. Richard's got this page uh, publicly on his site so you can go check it out. And uh, I think it's worth maybe um, just keeping that in mind when you are looking to uh, get some kind of custom grind or something like that. And you have a little bit of education now. All right, next question is from MJ Betty Goal on Instagram. Under what, under what circumstances would I want a soft nib? 
Why would you want a soft nib? Um, that's a really good question. Okay, so uh, soft nibs are something that not every company offers, and it's not super common, and it can mean different things to different companies. It's one of those things, it's kind of like, it doesn't have an extremely standardized scientific meaning to it. It just means that it's not uh, as stiff as uh, a regular nib. And there's really only a couple of companies that I know that even use the word soft in their nib size designation, right? Pilot comes to mind, uh, Platinum comes to mind. I'm trying to think if Sailor even has it. I don't know Sailor's line all that intimately, but um, those are the two that really come to mind. I have not heard, I mean, I've heard the word soft used to describe how pens write a lot, but in terms of like, you know, the Pilot Falcon, for example, the one we offer is a soft fine or a soft medium or soft extra fine. Um, they make a non-soft version of those pens, but for us, it's kind of like, why? You know, because <laughs> they're known for the softness. Um, but Platinum, like for example, their 3776, they had that, or the, the Pilot Custom 912, there's a soft nib available on that one. And it just basically just means it's a little springier. It could mean anywhere, anywhere between, it's got a little bit of a spring to it, so it just kind of acts like a little shock absorber while you're writing. It doesn't really give you any line variation, but it just feels softer, right? Like it's not as hard. A nib typically that doesn't move at all is called a hard nib, and uh, a soft one will give a little bit of spring to it, which is cool. Um, other nibs that could be soft, like the Falcon, for an example, could actually get some decent line variation out of it. And then kind of in the fountain pen community, the word soft can, in some people's minds, mean flex. So you got to designate between the two a little bit. Soft usually is not flex, okay? But sometimes it can be flexed out because of its softness to get some line variation. It's really going to be up to the manufacturer and how they want to kind of designate and promote it, whether or not it's really flex or not. But that's kind of how I like to say it. Like Paniter with their new nibs that are coming out, they're kind of saying, hey, this is really more of a flex, you know, their quill nib that they're coming out with. So it's going to depend on what you're looking for. Why would you want it? Um, you know, keeping in mind what it's for, it's going to give you um, a different feel to your writing than a really hard nib would. A hard nib, you're generally going to feel a little bit more. It's going to, it's not necessarily going to feel as smooth. It can still be really smooth, but you know, it's kind of like you can have a really smooth road that you're driving on in your car. You can have really smooth tires or whatever, but the softness of the nib is kind of like shock absorbers for your car. You know what I mean? So as you're kind of going down the road, you're gonna, you're gonna just absorb more of that kind of variation, which depending on your handwriting style, that could feel a little bit different. We actually feel way more in our fingers and hands than uh, we even re kind of realize. So even when you're writing with pens that are not really that different, you can feel a big difference and it can mean a lot in terms of how you perceive it. Um, with even just a little bit of bend to the nib. So it can make a big difference. So for some people, it's really, and you kind of have to, it's hard to explain, you kind of have to try it to know. I mean, I hate to say that because I'm an online pen dude and to say you have to try it kind of sucks, but uh, you would know it. Like if you use a soft nib, if you ever get the opportunity to, or you have somebody that, you know somebody that has one or something like that, um, it can definitely help. So that's definitely one thing to, to take into consideration. Um, and then the other one is if you're trying to get any type of line variation, you wanna get more flair to your writing or you wanna have any type of different writing feel, that is something that uh, you can attain uh, with a number of different soft nibs. So those would really be kind of the two reasons. If you want kind of a springier, more fluid feel to your writing, you don't wanna feel quite as much of the grab on the page, and then uh, if you want some line variation. All right, next question is from The Real Knitting Gale on Instagram. How do you know where to start? <laughs> I just like the frankness of that question. I feel like there are so many options and it's hard to know what to consider. Size, weight, flex, non-flex. It's daunting and hard to know what you're really getting without being able to test drive the pens. I do agree. It is hard. You know, I empathize with that, especially because, you know, most people don't really think that intently about their writing instruments. But then when they kind of get into fountain pens, there's so much to kind of get into and explore and discover that all of a sudden you think about how much a pen weighs, whereas you probably never thought about it or cared about it before in your life. 
I know I if sometimes use pens or maybe like a fleeting moment, I'm like, oh, this pen is too thin or this pen, you know, feels weird in my hand, but I never ever thought to measure how much a pen weighs when I was writing with it until I got into fountain pens. Or to think about the diameter of the grip of the pen or just, you know, things like that. Like once you get into it, you really start to care about all these little details that just were never that important to me before. So um, that is that is definitely one consideration. You know, all these different things that you're talking about, it can definitely be daunting because you're thinking about things that you've never really had to think about before. Um, so I'll go ahead and start out just by saying that we put a video together called Top 5 Fountain Pens for Newbies. I still think that video holds up even five years later or however old it is now. It's pretty old, but uh, still a super helpful video. It's I think our number two or number three video of all time. Very helpful and I do stand behind those pens. I think it's great looking at the Pilot Metropolitan, the Lamy Safari, Preppy Varsity, Jin Hao, I think they're all still really solid pens that you should consider. I don't think you need to spend a ton. You know, I think you need to invest a little bit, especially because you're getting into a new hobby. It's tool-based, so you have ink, maybe paper if you want to get into that, though you can skip getting into crazy paper if you want to at first. Um, the pen, ink, I think it'd be set. So I think if you set a budget, a reasonable budget for yourself, maybe $50, you know, which is a, it's an investment, but it's not, you know, all in. Like, you can give up getting you know, a fancy coffee a few times uh, and and save up 50 bucks pretty quickly if that's what you need to do. Um, and uh, and so I'll try and point you in the right direction a little bit. Spending, you know, you can get something like a Pilot Metropolitan or a Twisby Eco or, um, you know, a Varsity. Like, really, you can try out just for a few bucks. But um, starting, you know, kind of like walking, or sorry, crawl, walk, run is kind of like the, the phrase that we like to throw around here a little bit at Goulet. It's like, you don't need to go and get a Visconti Homo sapiens as your first pen just because you've heard that it's nice and people like it. You can start easy and then as you get deeper and deeper into it, then you consider going more and more nuts and getting into involved in things that way. Um, I would not get into flex. If you are just starting out, don't do it. Not because you can't, and not because I don't think you would enjoy it. It's just you're throwing yourself so much in the deep end and so many different variables that if things don't work out perfectly, you're not really going to understand why, and you're going to increase your chances of frustration right off the bat. Now, you can enjoy flex, but it's kind of like, you know, oh, I think I would like to learn a little bit more about music. Let me learn concert piano or let me get thrown on a banjo and try and play bluegrass right away like you're not technically there yet you know it's a more complicated instrument to play so maybe start out with you know I'm trying to think of an equivalent I went down a bad road with the whole musical instrument thing you know maybe start out with guitar or something where it's like you can just learn you know chords or you can read tabs and you don't have to understand all of music theory in order to be able to play the instrument right I guess that's kind of it. That kind of works. Sure, why not? So that's kind of where I like to go with it. Start, start easy. Start with kind of more foolproof pens, like the ones I had in the five pens for newbies video. Um, weight is good. Uh, the reason I like using weight is because um, it's something that you can measure with what you have right now. You can have pens that you have and you're like, this weight feels really good to me. And you can actually weigh it. I mean, assuming you have a scale where you can get some precision. If you have like a food scale in your kitchen, and you change it to grams, that can be super helpful. Sometimes you can do ounces too, that's a little less precise, um, but you can do grams and you can see, and we have weight measurements of all of our pens on our site, so you can get some idea there. That's kind of why I like that one. Size is a little tougher. If you have a pen that we also carry, you can compare it in our pen plaza. That's where that can be handy, but if you're just getting into pens, you have no fountain pens, we may not have the pen that you have as a comparison one, in our Nibnook, so that might not, or in the Pen Plaza, so that might not be as helpful. Um, but I mean, you can you can measure it. Measuring your own pens is kind of tough unless you have calipers. Uh, you can kind of do it with a ruler, but you're talking about some precision here. You're talking like maybe between like nine and 14 millimeters in diameter, and then the length is you know usually between five and six inches somewhere on there. It gets tough to get into such fine measurements on some of these pens that it can be hard to really measure out and know kind of what it is that you're working out, working with. I think it's better to just get a couple of inexpensive ones and know and find out what you like, and then you can kind of work from there. Um, if you, and then kind of the last thing here, if you are just getting into pens and you don't really know what you like, 
ask around for any people that you work with or go to school with or that are in your church or your family or your group of friends. See if anybody is kind of into fountain pens. Um, pro just because fountain pens are such a kind of an obscure but kind of interesting thing. And there's so much of like an evangelization kind of culture for people that get really into fountain pens that pretty much if you have somebody in your world that's into fountain pens, they're going to be so stoked to just tell you about their pens and try and get you into their world that they're going to be more than happy to let you try all the pens they have and show you what they have and play around with them and, and all that, that you may have uh, somebody who works in your office that you sort of know, but maybe not really. But then as you have pens more on your radar, you see them in a meeting and you're like, oh, that is a fountain pen. Let me go ask them. And you can say, hey, I saw you using a fountain pen. Are you into those? Because they seem kind of interesting to me. And they could be like, oh yeah, I have like 20 pens. Do you want to come by and check them out? Boom, you just have access to 20 pens that you did not have to buy. You can hold them all, you can get a sense for it. They probably, you know, would be interested to talk to you more about it and maybe could give you some pointers and maybe help you to kind of speed up that learning curve a little bit and then you can get more enjoyment out of them. I think that could be really helpful to you. And then lastly, of course, you can watch Fountain Pen 101, you can watch these videos here. Chances are, if you're sitting here 32 minutes into a Goulet Q&A video, you're probably already pretty deep in this anyway, but maybe you're in like super hardcore research mode and you just find me delightful and entertaining. <laughs> and maybe you just watch this for fun and you're not actually into fountain pens. Though I have a hard time believing that. We're pretty deep into it here, so um, maybe that's the case. Maybe if you, have, if you don't own a single fountain pen, go ahead and leave a comment on YouTube. If you are, don't own a single fountain pen, I would love to know that that's the case. And this is not like your first video. You like have kind of been into this for a while, but you're just like lurking and waiting and gaining research. That would be interesting for me to know. So leave a comment on YouTube. I'd love to engage with you a little bit. Anyway, next question. Quad Carry on Instagram says, how do micro scratches get on the nib? I have a three-year-old Mont Blanc 149 with scratches all over the nib and a six month old one and it's very shiny. It doesn't come into contact with anything else but a soft cloth. Ah, but does it? I'll get there in a second. Me and my friends were both wondering about this question and are stumped. Maybe THE Brian Goulet can shed some light. Okay, quad carry. I think I can shed some light. Well, here's the thing. Nibs don't just scratch themselves from the atmosphere. Something is scratching your nib. I can say that with 100% certainty um, because it's gold, right? And if you have a 149, probably looks a lot like this one. And it's probably made of yellow gold, right? Your nib, your big, beautiful Mont Blanc 149 nib, and it is a big, beautiful nib. Um, you're getting these micro scratches and chances are you're taking pretty good care of this pen because this is not an inexpensive pen. So unless you're throwing it around and being careless, but you said you're not. You said the only thing it comes in contact with was a, is a soft cloth. However, I don't think that that is the case. Reason being because you probably fill your pen with ink, don't you? I think what's happening is you are going to ink your pen, which this is a piston filling pen. The only way to get ink into this thing reasonably, it's not the only way, technically you can do another way. I'll get to that in a second. The only way that is commonly filled with a piston pen like this is you dip it into the bottle and then you pull it out. And if you're like me, you dip it in, the nib is all covered in ink and stuff like that. And you may be inclined to wipe the nib onto the glass bottle when you pull it out. And guess what? Glass is harder than gold. So glass can scratch your gold nib. I think that's what's happening. I even went so far as to look up the Mohs hardness scale. If you can remember that, if you're not too traumatized from your schoolhood days and you look up the Mohs hardness scale, gold is about a 2.5 to three. The Mohs hardness scale goes from one to 10. And depending on different metals, different materials, it can tell you how hard all these things are. Gold itself is about a 2.5 to a three. Glass is more like a four and a half to six. So it's actually fairly hard, glass is. Um, it's brittle, but it's hard. So I think the glass is causing some of those micro scratches on your gold over a long period of time of just filling and refilling and refilling. And that's why you have those micro scratches. 
It's a theory. It could be happening some other way. You could have some friend of yours at work that's like, <laughs> I hate this guy. I don't think that's the case. <laughs> that was weird. I don't know why I did that. But <laughs> chances are it's happening from the glass bottle as you are filling it. Um, good thing is you can actually fix that, okay? So you can take a polishing cloth. This is a Goulet one, but it doesn't have to be a Goulet one. Um, just uh, a polishing cloth, specifically like a jeweler's cloth that has a jeweler's rouge kind of built into the cloth is super handy uh, in these types of instances. Um, so you can get gold. I mean, it's it, this is jewelry. Like this is uh, metal. This is gold, right? Like this is just like if you had a ring or a bracelet or something. And you can take your jeweler's, jeweler's cloth and you can actually polish those fine scratches right off of your nib when the nib is dry of course and the pen is empty so you can just take and you can kind of polish it mine actually looks pretty good already but i'm going to make it look even more gooder oh yeah it's looking nice and there you go nice and polished now the gold nib is going to um, get those micro scratches uh, a little sooner than say a rhodium one right so this is a Mont Blanc 146, which technically is a two-tone nib, but some of the nib has a rhodium plating on it, or sometimes there might be a platinum or a palladium or something like that, depending on the style of pen. Rhodium is a more common one. Rhodium has a hardness of six. So rhodium is actually going to be a more durable plating, a more durable finish on your nib than yellow gold. Now, keeping in mind, Depending on what grade of gold you have, there may be other alloys and stuff like that. If you have a 23 karat gold or an 18 karat gold nib, that is going to have more gold content, therefore be a little bit softer than if you have, say, a 14 karat or even a 10 karat, depending on what plating is used on top of certain gold nibs. So that is definitely something to be taken into account. But if you are looking, it's not just an aesthetic thing of having like a rhodium trim over a gold trim. The rhodium itself is actually a little more durable and will resist those scratches a little better over time. Cool, huh? Anyway, thought that might enlighten you a little bit and I thought you would enjoy that. And truth be told, I never really thought about it quite that much until you asked me the question. So questions like these ones specifically, I love, and that's why I love doing Q&A because I did not know the answer to that. And I was like, I think I might be able to find the answer to that. I went out, researched it, Googled up the Mohs hardness scale and everything. I was like, isn't there a hardness scale of some kind? Saw the Mohs and I was like, boom. It was like I was back in 10th grade all over again, learning those sciencey things, you know? And uh, 10th grade, no, I didn't do that in 10th grade. When, do, when was I doing that? I think like earth science, maybe in seventh grade. And then I did it and I took geology in college. That I remember doing the hardness scale thing because we actually had like, you know, shale and we had like other, you know, lead and like other things like that that we would scratch and scrape and try to scratch glass with diamond and stuff like that. We didn't have any diamonds in school. What am I talking about? But you know what I mean? <laughs> anyway, hopefully that was enlightening to you. Next question. This is from Michael J. Culbertson on Instagram. What characteristics make for a good nib? How can you tell the difference between a nib that is poor overall and a nib that is simply poorly tuned? Well, I think if a pen is poorly tuned, it is pretty much poor overall, wouldn't you say? I don't know, maybe it could just look bad. Um, I think it's a super general question and it's kind of hard to answer without going into like super deep detail about nib construction. Um, I can get a little bit into that. There's a lot of factors that go into nib quality. Of course, you can have quality of materials, the type of alloy, the general design, the tipping material, how well the, it's welded onto the nib, the tipping specifically. Um, you know, you have uh, the slit that's cut in the nib, the slit position, like is it really sloppy? You know, is it clean? Is there like all this extra burrs and stuff like that from cutting the slit or has that been cleaned up? Um, there's lots of different details like that. So the overall general just quality of construction and design of the nib uh, could definitely be a factor. Um, but that stuff usually will contribute to it being poorly tuned. So it's not like you can really have a poor overall nib that's properly tuned necessarily, but there you have it. Um, 
So you can have a pen that is made well that is improperly tuned. So um, some things that you can definitely do to tell the difference. Looking at uh, just visual inspection, you're going to need a loop because you're not really um, you're not really dealing with a lot of material here. You know, fountain pen nibs are pretty small in the grand scheme of things. You're talking half inch to an inch long, maybe. So a loop is going to be pretty. You need some kind of magnification, a 10x, 15x loop to see what's going on, to see the slit, to see all these things. And even some of it then, you can't even really see it. You gotta go by feel. And that's where things get really tricky because if you don't know what it is you're looking for or how to adjust it, it can be really difficult and you can have a hard time with it. Um, so I would say that looking at um, uh, proper, uh, let's see here. Sorry, Rachel's like messaging me. I'm getting all distracted. Um, visual inspection using a loop. Yeah, looking for proper alignment of the tines. That's going to be like number one, especially if it feels scratchy. So you have these tines of the nib. You have your ball, your tipping material of the nib. You have two tines with a slit that's cut down the middle. And your tine alignment goes like this, right? If you have a misaligned tine when you're writing on the page, specifically if it's in one direction, whatever the drop tine is, that's going to like drag and it's like kind of chatter and it's going to feel scratchy. That's where uh, most of the problems come from in terms of the feel. In terms of ink flow, that's where you're dealing with the slit of the tines. And what you want to have, and this is hard to show you here, but basically what you want to have is where your breather hole is. I'll show you on this big, beautiful Mont Blanc nib, right? So your breather hole is going to be right in here. Oh boy, come on, zoomy. So you got your breather hole right there and you got the slit that goes from the breather hole up to the tip. Not every pen has a breather hole, but this just makes it very visually easy to show. So the slit is cut here and it goes up. There's gonna be a slight taper, a very, very slight taper that goes to the tip of that nib. That is going to assist in the capillary action of the ink that is going to allow it to kind of just constrict and go towards the tip. It's naturally gonna to wanna to do that due to capillary action of the water that's in the ink. So as you have that kind of flowing through, it is going to really flow well. You can have pens that where it's too tight together and the ink actually can't flow through very easily. That's when it writes really dry, you run into hard starting and stuff like that. You can have it where it's kind of splayed and too wide. You can also have issues with it writing too dry because of that, because if your tines are too wide spread apart, capillary action will actually work in the reverse direction and it will cause it to flow backwards and that's not good. So proper alignment of the tines going both this way and in terms of the width uh, can make a difference in terms of how your pen feels and flows. So it gets tough because unless you really know what you're looking for and even then when you do, you gotta test it, you gotta write with it. It takes a lot of practice, frankly, to be able to get that. Um, but really the best way to tell how properly tuned a nib is, is to write with it. Is it writing well? Is it flowing well? A properly tuned nib shouldn't require pressure to be able to write. It should just be able to write under its own weight. So that's what you should be able to do. And that's how you know whether it's properly tuned or not. If it's not, and you're able to kind of look and guess at a couple of things and you're still not able to get it to work, that's when you might need to get some help. Um, a nib meister like Mark Backus, um, Mike Modishaw, John Modishaw, Dan Smith. There's several of them out there who do this kind of thing and can adjust this kind of stuff. You can go to pen shows, you can get this kind of work done from people who do this all the time. Some of them might even have uh, information on their site that will give you some education around it. Um, but that is generally how you tell. And then to close out for this week, I have an ink question. Uh, this is from Supreme Leader Blazedge on Instagram. What bottles of ink are durable? I bring my bottle of ink with me every day to school in my bag, and last time the plastic cap broke. That's no good. Thank you and great videos. Well, you're very welcome. Um, okay, plastic bottles I think are the best for transporting like that. Um, generally you think of like glass, you know, being fragile and stuff like that. Um, so that's definitely can be the case. I tend to shy away from transporting glass bottles on a regular basis personally, you know, just because uh, the chance of them breaking is, is is too great for me and the way that I handle things. I have young kids and you know stuff like that, so I don't like to do that quite as much, but you do you. Um, 
I don't know what kind of bottle that you had previously, um, but you got to be careful about the cap too, because even if you have a cap, the cap itself can break, uh, even if the bottle is perfectly fine. So I have some that I think would be probably better to carry with you, and then some that I uh, think would be kind of middle of the road, and then maybe some that I would consider avoiding. Um, so ones that I have personally carried around quite a bit and uh, have never had a problem with are uh, both Dymine and Robert Oster. The Dymine 30 mil specifically, uh, because it's plastic, it's pretty durable, the cap seems pretty good. Um, same with Robert Oster, durable. I've thrown these around in my bag. I've never had a leak. I've never had uh, them break or anything. Not that they couldn't, but they've been pretty durable for me in my lifestyle. Um, I imagine you would get something similar to some other plastic bottles like the Visconti bottle. Not as practical in terms of its overall shape, but it is plastic and the cap seems pretty sturdy, so I think you would be generally okay with that. Um, and then, let's see here, another one is um, Organic Studios. Uh, that's a um, pretty sturdy bottle as well. The cap, I'm not 100% sure. I've never had an issue, but we haven't been carrying this bottle that long, so I don't know 100%, but I haven't seen it being an issue anywhere. Um, yeah, I think that would work. Um, other brands that I think would be fine, but you know, you would have to kind of see are like some of the heftier, you know, you know, glass bottles. If you if you want to go glass, so I'm going away from plastic a little bit and going to glass. If you want to carry them around, Pelican Edelstein is a very chunky, very durable bottle. Pilot Eroshizuku, a little bit middle of the road. I have had one Eroshizuku cap crack on me before, so maybe be careful with that. Faber-Castell, very meaty. It's got a metal cap. It's pretty dang durable. Uh, Aurora's got a pretty meaty bottle as well. Jerobon, their bottle is kind of square and chunky and flat, but it actually is pretty sturdy. Um, Colorverse, it's a newer brand, but their bottle is quite chunky as well. Again, kind of a weird shape, so maybe not your preference. And then Lamy as well is a very durable bottle. Um, again, big shape. So, you know, something like a Robert Oster or a Diamine, tend to, I tend to favor those. Maybe they don't hold quite as much, uh, the Robert Oster does, as like a, you know, Roshizuku or Lamy or something like that. The 30 mil is a little smaller, but it's so compact, it's so light and easy. Um, and then the ones that I would specifically try to avoid just because I've seen more issues happen with these in general. So I just, it's not that there's anything wrong with the bottles, it's just not ideal for transporting like what you're talking about. Uh, Dimine 80 milliliter bottles, especially if it's really cold out, we have more of these that tend to um, you know, have an issue uh, with that. I think it has to do with the shape of the bottle. I'm talking specifically about the glass. The caps are rock solid, but the glass uh, has more fragility to it. I think because it's like this, the flat and then the corners uh, of the bottle, that tends to be kind of the weak point. Uh, and then um, Deatramentis, you know, very rounded and stuff like that. Depending on how they're made, there can be some thinner parts. I will see these break a little bit more. And then uh, Noodler's three ounce bottles, sometimes it's the cap, sometimes, uh, not as often as a bottle, but sometimes the cap, they're very full bottles when you get them. Uh, I think just for transporting around a lot, it's also a lot of ink to be carrying around. So if you do get a, break or a leak or a breakage, it's gonna be very widespread with a bottle that holds that much volume. Um, I do think that you should uh, consider, you know, if you're gonna be traveling a lot and don't have any of these ones, consider some sort of other ink vessel. Um, as a student, probably not the most practical thing, but this is pretty dang cool, is a Visconti traveling ink well. Super handy, it allows you to fill your pen directly from it, and it's very, very durable. Um, so that's one thing. Um, Paniter, if you watch the video that I did with Dante Del Vecchio, Paniter is actually coming out with their own uh, version of like an ink transporting thing that's pretty cool and is gonna be made of plastic, so that'll be pretty durable as well. Um, and then uh, there's some other ones, like we sell ink sample vials. Those are a pretty good way to transport ink uh, around. They don't hold quite as much as a bottle of ink. You can fit about seven milliliters if you really fill those ink samples all the way, um, but that might be worth uh, looking into as well. But hopefully that can help you out. The ink sample one would by far be the cheapest option for you, especially if you already have a bottle of ink. All right, ooh, stretch a little bit. Okay, pretty solid q and I would say. My question of the week this week is, I'm just gonna go ahead and ask you for a little research and development for my next video here. What is the best fountain pen hack that you've discovered? The best trick, the best, you know, little, Thing that you've kind of figured out or heard from somebody else 
um, to help you enjoy your fountain pens more. And if there's any that I haven't thought of yet, uh, I will uh, get your input from the comments. That would be super helpful. So go ahead and leave those comments on YouTube, Facebook, blog. I'd love to know what those are. Hope you've enjoyed this. You can check out a lot of what I talked about here on GoulayPens.com. Hope you have a good rest of your week. 